Hello, hello. Welcome to Cyber Sensei, the definitive podcast for cybersecurity educators brought to you by Cyberbit. I'm Sharon, CMO at Cyberbit. Welcome back, most of you. Uh, quite a few familiar faces here. And if this is your first time here, welcome to Cyber Sensei. Uh, hi, Adam. Nice to see you again. Hi. Uh, and uh, great to greet our two special guests. We'll introduce you uh, more formally in just a second. Hi, Matt McKinley and Daryl Davis. Nice to have you here. So uh, before we start, just a few uh, housekeeping reminders. Uh, we are obviously live. Uh, this is a live podcast, so you can ask anyone questions in real time. And I encourage you uh, to do so over chat or just raise your hand and we'll open your uh, microphone during the, the second part of the session. And uh, we'll do that in about 30 minutes. So just raise your hand and we will unmute you or just type in your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the, uh, of the Zoom uh, application and we will answer them either in real time or during the Q&A. The session is being recorded uh, and we will distribute a recording uh, on the leading podcast platforms. You can stream it uh, on Spotify, Google, and the rest of the leading platforms, as well as the Cyberbit YouTube page, which you can see on video. Uh, and all the updates will also be published on Cyberbit's LinkedIn profile and on our website. So absolutely make sure that you follow Cyberbit on LinkedIn to um, get more updates and future content and podcasts that uh, we will be running. Uh, and Adam, uh, feel free to take it from here and introduce our guests. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you back. This is a session today we're going to have, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, going back about almost four years ago, there was a relationship uh, that I was able to develop with an organization called the City of Refuge in Atlanta, Georgia. And Shahar, if you could drop that link to the City of Refuge so our audience knows who that is. But this program was specifically designed for the, the, the citizens of the 30314 zip code. So rather than getting all the demographics of inner city Atlanta, Shahar, if you could drop that link so the audience can see the demographics that uh, Matt and Daryl here are serving in that zip code. But this program was started uh, with an $8.2 million grant from the Department of Labor that the City of Refuge won, again, back in the, about three years ago, 2020. And it's specifically to help the individuals and families in transition out of crisis. And this particular program was designed to do a coding academy. And there's also a part of it that was designed to do cybersecurity. And I was the founding director of the Carolina Cyber Center that helped them win this grant and was the first one to architect this program. But what I'm really pleased to talk about today is the two gentlemen who took the program that, that I left, and they took it to a whole nother level. They took it to the next level I was not capable of doing. And I'm really proud of the work that they've done. So let's start with who is Matt and who is Daryl? So Daryl, let me start with you. Ask to tell the audience a little bit about your background and how you got into this career of cyber education, and then we'll go to Matt. Okay, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, my name is Daryl Davis, and I've been in the IT cybersecurity world for a little over 30 years. I actually started out as a marketing analyst for IBM Business Centers. I was love the PC more than I love the, the uh, marketing analyst position. And so I moved down into the tech support area. And from there, I took off and became a tech support manager, a field engineer, sales engineer. And on the way, I picked up some certs, some instructor certs, Novell, Microsoft CompTIA. And I became a uh, network consultant and network architect. And then I did something weird. I went and, <laughs> and decided to go and get into the legal field where I was a small business consultant for the SBA, I handled landlord tenant issues and data privacy drafting. Then I flipped back around and became a cybersecurity instructor and a GRC consultant. And that's where I am today. And what a gift you've been to the students here. But we'll come back to that. Matt, what was your journey? Well, um, my career started in pretty much pure network engineering and support. And um, from there, I uh, worked with a number of uh, firewall companies, which is where I got my introduction to cybersecurity proper. And from there, I took over and started managing a global support team. And as part of that, I was uh, often tapped to lead training classes uh, for customers. And um, and from there, I went into sales engineering and consulting and uh, never lost my love for training, though. And at some point along the way, 
um, I had the opportunity to move down to Australia where I really got into pursuing teaching more or less full time. And when I moved home from Australia in 2016, my career sort of pivoted and I went into uh, technical instruction full time. And that's uh, that's where I am today. So I, I have about um, 25 years of experience in cybersecurity, and I try to bring all of that experience into the classroom with me. Awesome. So to give this audience a context of where you teach and what you do, I know they've got the, the link in here, but in your words, Matt, let me ask you, what are the what's an overview of the demographics and the students that you're you're teaching now? Because I think a lot of people think these are young people. This is quite a broad spectrum that you're serving. Yeah, the 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 we have students as young as 19 and as old as their late 60s. Mm. And so we, and I think Daryl would probably echo those sentiments as well. So it's a really broad spectrum of, of learners and um, it, it's, it brings unique challenges to the classroom, trying to appeal to, to all of those audiences. But yeah, demographically, it ranges in age from 19 to say 65. Awesome. Now, the goal of this podcast is to help our audience of cyber instructors and leaders and educators help put what they've learned into action from this session. So let's paint the picture a little bit more focused for them. Daryl, let me ask you, give them, give this audience a summary of the curricula that was designed, the length of the program, how intense it is, and what the certifications and the education you're after for these students. That's a good question. This is a very very good program. I've been teaching for quite some time and I've never seen anything like it before. The program is meant for a wide range of, of students. It's a nine month program. We provide training through those nine months with six classes. We start out with ITF plus and we have a different flavor of network plus operating system. We call the PC essentials. Then we move into network plus server plus a programming language we call Python, introduction to Python, and then we finish up with Security Plus. And these are the six courses that we, we offer. Now, three of those, those courses, uh, ITF Plus, Network Plus, and Security Plus, we offer a free voucher, and most times two, two vouchers to the students to allow them to complete those CompTIA certifications. We add that to their resume. We also, in addition to providing training we also find a, a real, very good program that's geared towards soft skills, which is um, personal development, where we have instructors like yourself, Adam, that come in and try to get the students to be able to get a job, but more importantly, maintain that job. And Matt, let me turn it over to you. There's some things, special things that you have woven into this program, the live fire exercises, the hands-on exercises that you built. Give a, the, the team, before we get into that, give them a perspective, sort of the macro level indicators of the program, number of students per cohort, graduation, jobs, salaries. Summarize that for us. Yeah, so uh, the number of students per cohort is approximately 22 students. And... Um, so it, it's uh, it's approximately uh, 22 students and, you know, there's a range of different activities that we employ, um, you know, like you mentioned, live fire exercises and, and things of that nature to um, to really garner engagement and to get people to um, not just learn the material, but uh, truly internalize the material. And you've also done some things like with Ron, if you could talk a little bit about what he does, who he is, his role of bringing in thought leaders to come speak on a very, very regular basis, and what that means to the program. Yeah, so as Darren was mentioning, part of the program also includes soft skills um, and really preparing people for the workforce. And so we work with a gentleman here at uh, City of Refuge. His name is Ron. Ron Cofield, and Ron is responsible for getting interest from the broader business community in the Atlanta area. So that would include people like Home Depot, Chick-fil-A, Delta, you know, a lot of, a lot of the large companies that call Atlanta home, they bring, um, or Ron brings in guest speakers from the, all of those organizations to speak to the students 
and give them a real sense of what it's like to be in the um, cybersecurity field. And those, those speakers are everybody from recruiting all the way up to the C-suite. And so um, it gives a, a huge, a huge uh, range of perspectives that, um, that the students can really learn from. And by the time that you know, they learn all the material, as Daryl was saying, they learn all the material from Network Plus and ITF Plus and Security Plus. But all of that material by itself is sort of, it, it, it has limited value unless you have the perspective in, for where the, the knowledge is really utilized. And so and so Ron Cofield really does help to, to bring that piece to the program uh, to really round it out nicely. And one of the first lessons that our audience can shamelessly steal the best of what others have already mastered to steal from Shane Parrish that you guys have done is they could have somebody at their school bring in thought leaders, but it's the fact that the students are hearing a consistent message week over week, month after month, the dwell time to hear that message of how important it is for discipline and continuous learning. But there's another aspect to it. You host, and I forget how often you do this every, I think like three times per cohort where you have these, um, like the happy hours, the mixers, where these thought leaders can come in and they get to watch the development of the students because they meet them early in the program. They meet them several different times. They get to watch the arc of their development and that changes the way they think about the students. Can you summarize what happens in those mixers and why they're of value? Yeah, so the mixers, the mixers give those people from those companies that I mentioned a moment ago, time to interact with the students and really, really identify the, the students that would be the best possible candidates in their organization. Um, so they get to see the student from the very beginning. They get to see how the student learns how the student um, behaves in the class, how they are internalizing the material, um, and what their interests are. Um, that's, that's a really, really big thing that I think inviting those people in uh, provides is they get to see where the interest of each student lies because some students are going to gravitate more towards the network engineering side. Some are gonna to gravitate towards say the GRC side of things. And it helps the, it really does help the, the, the people that come in from all of those companies really get a feel for where each student would be a value of potential value in their organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for mentioning the names of some of the companies. There's a, towards the end of this podcast, we're going to do a judo move on some of the names of those companies. Remember, these are companies that have deep cybersecurity needs and point of sale, airlines, ICE who runs the, the, the stock exchange. And so it's going to be interesting, the, the lessons learned that Daryl and Matt are going to share about those companies. But Daryl, let me turn it over to you and some of the, the things that you specifically have brought to this program that our audience could learn from what you've done to, to take this program to the next level. Yes, thank you so much. Let, let me say this. When I first started working for City of Refuge via uh, Carolina Cyber Center, the uh, cybersecurity program had some issues, to be frank. And one of the issues was the pass fail rate for the CompTIA test was pretty low. So Matt and I had to come in and we had to make some changes. And there were four changes that I made when I first started teaching. One is I created my PowerPoint slides to provide a bridge between the CompTIA book and the learning experience. And we all know that CompTIA books can be challenging. The second thing I did was to use my whiteboard skills. And this is, this is my bread and butter. This is my secret weapon. I call the secret sauce that allows me to get these complex, com these complex concepts to the students so that they can do better and, and perform better on the test. The third thing I did was to teach the students how to learn. There are different ways to learn, and there's no one way to learn. But you'd be surprised that a lot of the students that come to the class, the last time that they actually thought about learning was when they were in high school. So we had to go back and say, let's find out what is it? What is your learning style? And not only what is your learning style, but what is your winning learnable style? If you continue to fail in that old adage, you keep on doing the same old thing and expecting different results. When were, that's the problem we were having initially. So we had to come up with a winning style for learning. And the last thing is, and this is the most important thing in order to improve performance, 
is that we had, I teach, and I believe Matt does too, we teach to the test. Let's be frank, let's be honest. Cybersecurity tests are like a game. And for me, I've been doing this for a while. If you understand the game and you understand the rules, you can perform better. So what we do is at the end of our lesson plan, our study plan, we're getting ready to get into the mode, that attack mode to passing a test. We do practice tests and then we go over and over those tests, but not just going over tests. We actually take a test and we ask the question, why was that the right answer? And not only that, why were the other answers not the right choice? So to recap, I came in, we come up with PowerPoint slides to bridge that gap between the book and, and, and the experience. The secret sauce, what I like to call whiteboard experience, skills, teach students how to learn, and also practice tests in order to get those certs. And we yeah, have, uh, Adam, just to interrupt uh, because we have a question that is related to the previous topic, and then we can go on with the secret sauce, which I think a lot of the educators you would be interested to, to learn from. But there's a question uh, from Alvin uh, about your corporate outreach program and getting those thought leaders to speak. The question is how successful was the corporate outreach program and in terms of corporate thought leaders coming in to speak and offer real world insights? So any tips on how to make that more successful mm -hmm. and how successful was it? Who wants to take it? Is that Daryl, who's the best to answer? I, Matt? I, think, Matt. Matt. I think I can take this one. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can answer how successful it was um, or how successful it is by saying that um, that there has been no shortage of people to come and speak. We um, the and now I'm not privy to all the details that go on in the background about how they you know they they actually recruit the the companies to to come and speak, but there has been no lack of interest. Um, we the the calendar and Daryl can vouch for this. The calendar for speakers is always full, um, and it is I'll say this: it is a full time job on the part of uh, Ron Cofield who spends so much time uh, networking and reaching out to these organizations to get them in here. So it takes a considerable amount of effort. In fact, it's the full-time job of, of one person here to do that, but uh, it has been um, phenomenally successful um, because there is, I think from the perspective of the potential employers, they're, they're getting to see a pool of potential candidates who are undergoing a rigorous education program and who are also in, in many cases, they're in the prime of their careers. And so I think it's very attractive for these organizations to want to come in and see uh, what's going on here and, and how their organizations might also benefit from it. A couple Great. of nuances to add there. First of all, Ron Cofield is just a phenomenal person. I've worked with him now for three years off and on, but his full-time role isn't just to bring the speakers in. He also is the placement to building relationships with corporations. And he, along with Jeannie, build this, uh, the mixers that they have, and he aligns the talent coming into the program from the corporate world. And then when we get to the last part about this competition, Ron is, is key to that as well. So his background as an executive with KPMG, his personal demeanor and character is phenomenal, but it is hugely successful for the students to hear week after week, the same kind of message from, from people who have been successful in the field. Very, very successful. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me uh, come to you, Matt, when, when you took over the program, and again, so for the audience to know, Daryl is teaching one co cohort and Matt's teaching another cohort. They're overlapped, but they're separate classes, but they're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. So Matt, what did you bring to the program? What did you do to help take it to the next level? Well, the first thing I did was I, I realized that um, that most of the CompTIA material, as, as um, Daryl pointed out, is pretty academic and it's um, to the to the uninitiated learner, it's somewhat unapproachable. And so the, the first thing that I did was I wanted to make it as approachable as um, humanly possible. So I wanted to make the material real. And to do that, I took the students on field trips as much as possible. I took them out of the classroom. I showed them, like, for example, when we were working with network equipment and things like that, or we were talking about networking and subnetting and 
all of the all, all of these complex esoteric topics, I took the students out and I showed it to them. I, I showed them what a real network cabinet looks like, what a server room looks like, what a what a switch is, and the differences between switches and hubs, and not just explaining to them what it is, but showing them what it is, like making the material as real as humanly possible. And I and I, you know, it, it's. It's not always possible to do that with every subject, but for many subjects, when and where possible, I, I tried to make it as real as I could. And in places where there wasn't things to touch, see, taste, or feel, I drew on my background and I explained to the students um, using real world examples from my background on, you know, uh, elucidating some of the concepts that we were covering. Um, Another thing, uh, another thing that I did was um, I, I employed as many methods as I possibly could to teach the material. So, um, so the book, the book tells, you know, the book has one method for doing things, but I tried to come up with as many other methods for showing the students how to uh, how to get a concept as I possibly could. So, for example, with subnetting, yes, there are, there are ways that you can do subnetting through counting, but I also showed them the the binary math aspect of it. So basically, what I did was I gave them choices. You know, uh, here's the same concept. Here are the choices that you can choose from, and what best works for the learner. Some people are great at math, and the binary method might approve might agree with them better. Um, another thing that I did was I encouraged group participation. So when, where possible, especially like, for example, when we did uh, the coding class where we studied Python, mm -hmm. um, there were several, there are several adjacent subjects to any programming language like development methodologies and agile and waterfall and things of that nature. So to, to teach those types of things, I broke the class up into groups and there was a single program to write, but I gave each group a function. And I said, all right, this group does this function, this group does this function, this group does another function. And then I appointed sort of a scrum master to help bring it all together into a single unified program. And it really taught the students, it really taught them you know, how to develop, number one, but it also told, it taught them how to work together and how to collaborate. And so it brought in some of the soft skills along with some of the, you know, the, the actual, the, the technical skills. And the last thing I did to really, um, to nine months, in case we haven't stated it directly yet, the program is nine months long. And it, it is a serious, serious commitment on the part of the students. Um, and it's, it's a serious commitment for the, the instructors as well. But, but one of the things that I like to do that, that I, I like to give brain breaks in there as much as possible. And so I encourage going off script. That's one of the things that we do in our classroom. And we we talk about topics as weird as classical music and poetry to random discussions. We have show and tell, you know, I'll bring in old technology because I think that I think that students can't fully appreciate where we are until we know where we've been. And so I like to bring in a lot of old technology, vacuum tubes and stuff like that, just to kind of give the students some perspective on how far we've come and, and how unique and special it is to be able to study cybersecurity. So those are some of the things I did. We have a couple of questions. Saron, you want to facilitate those questions for us? Out of mute now. I'll read them out to you. Um... All right, from uh, Marilyn, uh, Daryl, you spoke about students having access to one or two free vouchers. How are you or your institution able to do this, if you can elaborate on that? Well, Adam, you may be able to ask that question. You know more about how the, how the funding was um, obtained from the, the government. Yeah, we, we put the proposal together and we came up with a total cost per student of the program. And originally we had one voucher per, stu per student. But as I mentioned, you know, these are students that haven't been learning to learn. Sometimes 
10, 15, 20, 30 years. So we learned that to keep their momentum going, but we put it into the grant request. So it is a, it is reimbursable to Department of Labor to add up to multiple vouchers per student to give them the best chance to pass the test. So we baked it into the program. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and a uh, question to Matt from Anna. How do you reach out to local businesses and set up a field trip for your students? Can you explain the process? I guess if some people want to learn how to do that themselves. Well, uh, well, we so we didn't really take any field trips to local businesses. What we did was here at City of Refuge. So a little bit more about City of Refuge. So City of Refuge um, was founded in 1997 and it's on a very large campus. And the campus was here in the 30314 um, zip code. Um, it, it, it's not, well, let me put it this way. It was a, an abandoned warehouse space um, in, in Atlanta, and it was donated to City of Refuge. And it is a large campus with, with a very large complex networking environment. And so when I did the field trips, I did them locally here because there were server rooms, there are racks full of computers, there are wireless access points. Um, basically, basically, I worked with what I had. Mm -hmm. So I, I never did orchestrate any field trips to, to client sites or anything of that nature. I used what we had here. You know, it, it's a it's a pretty lean, mean machine here at City of Refuge. And so we tried to work with what we had. And so all the field trips I did were basically around campus to show students, you know, for example, this is what a wireless access point infrastructure looks like. This is what fiber looks like between buildings. This is this is what an equipment rack looks like. This is a switch, you know, all of those kinds of things. So I did it as locally as possible. And fortunately, doing that didn't require too much um, coordination uh, or even effort. It was basically a situation where I said, all right, everybody get up. Let's go on a field trip. And so that's that's how we did it. And it, 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 it had a, it, it had the, it, it had the effect that I was hoping for. And another, thank you uh, very much, Matt. And another um, question from Alvin to Daryl. And uh, did you find a specific learning style that works better for most of the students? Ah, great question. Great question. Uh, let, let me take, let me uh, answer the question this way. Uh, and Adam would probably agree. Why don't we talk about quickly how do you can improve the program? And there are four things I think I can, I personally can use to improve the program. In addition to the secret sauce, you know, my whiteboard skills, I've done um, four things. One is I've come up with this, I call it pseudo Socratic method of teaching in order to get complex concepts to students. And this is what I do. I'll fake the funk. In other words, I'll, I'll feign or fake ignorance about a topic and then I'll allow the group to to come up with a solution. It's worked well with Security Plus, but I had, hadn't worked that well with uh, ITF, uh, PC Essentials, and, and Network Plus. And I think because the students don't really have an idea of what networking is all about. The second thing I've, I've come up with is going back to that Teach to the Test, I've gone and created these Blackboard tests. We use Blackboard LM as our digital learning platform. And so I've become pretty proficient of, in creating these Blackboard tests. The third thing that I've done to help to foster the learning ethos is I wanna, I wanna implement, I want to insert a network design exercise project into this nine month program, which will allow the students, I'll come up with some scenarios and then the students will go out and use Visio or network uh, notepad and do, do what Matt was just saying, you know, on 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 their software based on a scenario put in some switches a router firewall cloud you name it and use that as an exercise and the last one the last thing i really 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 believe in this i'm gonna really make this work i want to do since i have the nine month program nine months to work with i want to do what's called student-led topic review I'll come up with some difficult topics as we go through the material in the book. And then I will make it mandatory that students stand up, go to the whiteboard, the whiteboard, 
and I want them to lead the class on something that we just learned about. It does two things. One is going to solidify that learn, learning how to learn, right? And But also it's going to help them with soft skills. Now, I've had some pushback, but I'm not backing down on this one. And I think that it will help them out when they get out into the real world, get a job, and not only get that job, but maintain that job. Yeah, Daryl, I think the science on this is quite clear. It's not so much how often the student puts it into their brain, it's how often they get it out verbally, kinesthetically. That's actually shown scientifically to, to enhance the student's learning. So I love the fact that you're doing the practice test over and over, getting to come to the whiteboard and exercise, doing things collaborative as a team. It forces them to get it out. And as Matt probably was mentioning there, it's like sometimes students would rather learn from each other than from us. Yeah. You know, cool. Hey guys, let me let me come back to, there were some other roles. We talked about a role like Ron, where he's getting that corporate engagement speakers and helping him get jobs and stuff. But you also have roles like a class coordinator, the, and I forget the lady's name, but you, you have some people that are helping the student success. And you have another one that helps you co-manage the class inside. Can you describe those roles and how important they are to the success of your program? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Daryl and I both have a TA and the TA helps us take care of um, a lot of the, the, the classroom dynamics. They help, they help us in the review sessions. They help us track attendance. They help us track issues. They, uh, with students, in other words, if a student needs access to me or Daryl for, you know, a one-on-one -on -one session, they help mediate that and, and broker our time a little bit. Um, they, they really help in the, the administration of the labs. That's an area where they provide a lot of value uh, is, is one of the things um, that the course provides are some very deep and complex labs. And so I've always felt that labs are of limited value if you don't provide any sort of context behind them and um, also some help. And so the, the TAs really help us in um, administering those labs and helping to provide some of the context that's needed for um, successful lab completion. And completing the lab is just one part of it, understanding what you did is the really big part of it. And so the TAs really, really help us uh, help us out there. Uh, and Daryl, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I really do. And I'll make it real quick, but I wanna uh, do a shout out to the City of Refuge and di digital, digital craft personnel for really bringing this whole thing together. Uh, I don't think people realize that City of Refuge and Digital Craft, they've done a yeoman's job, a yeoman's job of screening the applicants. When I started this program a little over a year ago, I, I can guarantee you they, the, the program has had over thousands of applicants who want to become a part of this program. And City Refuge personnel and digital craft have gone out and whittled that down to 15 to 25 students per cohort. And that's a phenomenal job, but we need to understand something also. And it's been one of my weaknesses throughout my career is that some students are just not going to be successful. It's, it's great to say, okay, I'm going to have 100% pass rate on all of my certs, 100%, I'm going to get these students to um, get jobs, but that's not, that's not doable in the real world. And let's face it, you know, some of the students are really probably shouldn't be in, in the IT field, let alone the cybersecurity field. So that's one of the things that I, I, I think the program has done a great job at doing the screening process. And they, but every now and then you're going to have students that are going to um, not be able to succeed. But kudos, kudos to City of Refuge and Digital Craft. I think, Darryl, I, a, yeah, oh, I, I have a question from, from my less educated perspective because you guys really know the program well, but your end quote unquote product, uh, what sort of roles are you aiming for eventually for your graduates? So, like a penetration tester, a tier one analyst, is it the network coder? What's your yes. tar tar target role? What would that, all, all of the yes. above? <laughs> yes. That, yeah, the breadth of the different roles. Yeah. Some have gone into governance, risk and compliance, some identity and access management, some directly onto a SOC, some security analyst working on a network team. Mm -hmm. 
the the foundational and some to be honest right some decide not and don't go into cybersecurity directly they go into a service desk role or network role but they're very well prepared for a broad spectrum but that uh, that was part of our goal but i want to come back in answer to that question because we're going to ask a very very poignant question here and that is daryl and matt the goal of the program wasn't to just always choose 100 percent successful students or also you know, waste the taxpayers' money on students where we can't make the biggest dent in their lives. And so you take a risk. You know, you take a risk on some students and some others that come in. But if you could talk to the audience about just at a high level, the number of students that the percentage of students that get jobs and the average salary rates they have when they graduate versus what they have, say, a year later. Uh, Daryl, you want to go first? No, you go ahead and you take that one. Okay. So the... So, so Adam, just just to to be clear, you're 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 asking about uh, the the percentage pass rate and placement rate and that kind of thing. The percentage that get jobs and then what their salaries are. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, though I don't have a great deal of visibility into salaries, the percentage of the percentage of people that get placed, I think, is it, it's it, it's around sixty um, percent. Mm -hmm. It, it's around 60%. So um, right out of the program, uh, our goal. Um, so let me give a little bit more context. So uh, part, of, part of the program, as we mentioned earlier, is providing them with both the technical skills and the soft skills. The soft skills really focuses on creating resumes, building a LinkedIn profile, and each student is given a mentor. So every student is assigned a mentor and that mentor works in conjunction with people here at City of Refuge, not the least of which is Ron Cofield, to do things like mock interviews. So the goal is to have them placed in a job, ideally at or about the same time they graduate. And the success rate with that has been right around 60%. Now, the other 40%, they they often do get jobs. It doesn't happen as immediately as it does for that sixty percent, but they often they will often get jobs sometime after the program. Now it the, that length of time may vary, but but our our placement rate is about sixty percent of candidates, and um, and they go out there very well prepared. The 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 program gives them the technical skills they need, and it also provides them all of the soft skills because we want to prepare them for, you know, the program wants to prepare them for a job in the tech field, but it also really wants to give them a head start on it, life in general. And so, so like I said, it's, it's about 60%. The, uh, the salary range that I, that I've seen since I've been there, it's been a little over a year, the low end, someone that is a network analyst is around 55,000 and the top end, a cyber Level level one cyber analysts, 88,000. So it 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 varies based on the the employer, the uh, work experience. Because some of our students they they do come actually super prepared and ready to rock and roll. Whereas some of the other students, you know, they they've got to find their niche. But one of the things that Matt was saying, I want to expound on that we have students that, and initially do not, get a job offer, but. We just don't throw them out. Carolina Cyber, Digital Craft, they're constantly working with those students to make sure that they get placed. And we have students that in three months to six months, they found a job working in help desk, wow. but that help desk job paying $55,000 in six months, they're in the 60 range, they're in the 70 range. So we're doing a really good job on, on placement. Can we do a better job? Yes, we can, but we're doing a great job. We've got a Very question. Impressive. Yeah, we've got a technical question. So we talked about from uh, Vinay or Vinay, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. You talked about servers, switches, wireless points, etc. Can you comment on what basic technology infrastructure is needed or, or is recommended to start a program? And what mm -hmm. steps have you used to improve your technologies as your program grew? So what technologies are you using to power your program and make it a little bit more interesting. Hmm. Um, what technologies we're using to make the program a little bit more interesting? 
Um, well, um, I think in terms of specific technologies that we use to make the program more interesting, I think um, I think the best way to answer that is creativity. Um, we don't, I wouldn't say that we use any specific technologies that help make the program more interesting. Now, one thing that we do is, is we employ, we employ some technologies uh, for review and things like that um, to help us make the review more interactive. So we use, I'll give you an example. We use a program called Kahoot sometimes mm -hmm. that gives that, that gives the students sort of a team-like environment or kind of like a, a buzzer environment where they can buzz in and answer questions. And so we, we just use a lot of creativity. And Daryl said something earlier that I cannot, that I cannot underscore enough that we use. And I know this is going to sound archaic, but the whiteboard has been the greatest th invention uh, since the wheel. Thank you. <laughs> we use the, we okay. use the whiteboard because s since the invention of the wheel, the the whiteboard has given us a chance to diagram the wheel, and so we use the we use the whiteboard to do absolutely everything. And I and I know while it does sound archaic. In the real world, you're going to be whiteboarding a lot. If you're in, if you're in a software development company, if you're in network engineering, if you're in GRC, whatever it is, there's a lot of whiteboarding that goes on. And so, we, you know, we get the students up there in front of the classroom. We get them used to using the whiteboard. So we use the whiteboard to amazing effect in these courses. And um, um, I think because these are in-person courses, I don't know if we've directly stated that yet, but there are no virtual, there's no virtual offering for this class. It is five we've days. Tried, yeah. We've, we've, we've tried, though. We've tried. Yeah. So, yeah. But... But there, there is really something to be said for being in person and in front of people where you can really connect with them. You can see body language, gauge their level of engagement. Um, and so I, I guess if you really wanted to hone it right down, the big thing that we've done is bring back people. You know, the, the pandemic really derailed all of that but the amount of the amount of interaction and the positivity that we get just from being in the classroom face to face has been a huge huge um tool in our in our toolbox so i, I know that that's kind of a nebulous long-winded answer but but the whiteboard and face-to-face -face learning have been two of the greatest things uh for this course and and has, has really uh really taken it up a notch and as study after study shows, we become the average of the five people that we hang around the most. And you guys have brought them together in an environment with Ron and Jeannie and Alexis and John and these other leaders that are there. And you've provided a sense of character and leadership. And what I love about the program is I've reviewed what you've, you've done is, right, you've got the certifications because if they don't have a good resume, they don't get the interview. Then you prepare them on how to carry themselves with that sense of character and pride and clear communication and answering difficult questions in an interview, but you leave them with the character to not just have a have a get a job, but to have a career. And that's a different level of expectation that you're putting on these students with. And for our audience, remember, this is a specific cohort of students, a specific demographics, right? If they'd made great life decisions and they came from moderately income families, they probably wouldn't be in this program and be in this position. So they're changing their pattern of thinking, their mental models, and giving them the gift of the joy of learning. And then, of course, the best thing you're going to do is give them a job. Then um, we have another question. Let me take this as well. Anonymous, can can you talk? This is to an entire group. Can you talk about where cybersecurity is going in the future? Very strategic question. With AI coming, how will this impact or help the cyber landscape? I think maybe to the, let's put it in the context of cybersecurity education, so it can be helpful for the rest of the attendees. Uh, are you looking, I'll kind of rephrase it, are, are you looking at certain trends in cybersecurity uh, in terms of how you want to shape the program in the future? AI mm -hmm. is an example. And I think there's some, some other things that are happening that are maybe near term, shorter term. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it, it's a good question. Uh, one thing that I have discussed with Ron and 
and Matt, you probably can chime in on this as well, is that we're, we're constantly tweaking the program and we're coming up with some additional programs that actually address the knowledge base as it relates to uh, AI and some of the other newer technologies that, that are out in the, in the field. For me personally, uh, I, I believe that having an understanding of data analytics as it relates to cybersecurity is probably a good, a good match. Um, other than that, um, who knows? You want to take over, Matt? Uh, how much are question? you? I, I want to maybe to focus on another aspect. How much are you um, implementing cloud security in your classes? This is something I'm seeing. It's almost not touched uh, in higher education, and you kind of get into this fully cloud-based world when you graduate. And how much are you addressing that? I think I see a huge gap here. Yeah, well, we, we actually touch we actually touch on cloud in the server plus class, but mm -hmm. uh, based on the, the grant as it stands, those are the six main courses that we teach. But hopefully down the road, Adam, hint, hint, we, <laughs> we get we get a, a another grant and we can make some modifications to the to the curriculum where that we actually have cloud as well as a couple of other courses like Linux that are that are meshed into the curriculum that will then bridge that gap in order, to, in order for students to be able to say, yes, I have some form of certification when it comes to uh, the cloud. We also have another class that we actually just started, uh, City of Refuge started, that includes a blockchain, cloud, yeah. and I can't think of the other, maybe you can help me out, man. I can't, can't think of the other class that um, they offer. But um, so we are, we are, the City of Refuge is looking into bringing in those two Artificial intelligence, that was the one. They're actually yeah. trying to bring in that in as well. But uh, again, the, 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 the grant only said, you know, we, when it was written, it stated that only six classes, cert, certain types of classes we would provide in order to get, get to that cybersecurity analyst level. One of the things that we're seeing, you know, we, we have quite a lot of customers in higher education who are using our cyber range and our cyber labs as part of their programs. Or, mm -hmm. The AWS labs, for example, are mm -hmm. one of the most popular um, ones that are being used because it's quite difficult to generate this sort of infrastructure in a learning environment and kind of run these attack vectors on on cloud infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. I that's an interesting an interesting way to close the gap is actually to offer like live cyber live labs actually replicate those those, uh, those environments i think that's one of the big gaps we see in terms of the, the jump between the infrastructure that you work on in the university and then in your workplace is mm -hmm. or those cloud environments aws azure particularly hey team uh, we uh to value everybody's time we've got a coming up here late and please uh, audience put your questions in but earlier i talked about the judo move this conversation we'd have about the companies remember these are Delta Airlines, PAR Technologies, Chick-fil-A, Internet Intercontinental Exchange, again, that runs the stock exchange. Well, towards the end of the program, and Daryl and Matt talked about, they teach to the test. Yes, because if you don't get that certification in the resume, you don't get the interview. You don't pass, go and collect your $200. But the ultimate test of whether the students have real world work experience is you compete the students against those corporations in a live fire exercise. And I don't know who the bonehead was that came up with that that idea. <laughs> okay, I do, but I'm not going to say it here. Anyway, but that's yeah. a pretty gutsy move. So Matt, Daryl, tell us how that competition goes. What's it like for the students and the corporate teams? And what's the learning? What's the what's the success rate of the teams? Well, Daryl, I'll turn it over to you. I haven't been through my first one yet, so you're the uh, you're the veteran on, on on that front. So. Why don't you take that one? Okay, it it's the culmination of this nine month program, is where the students are getting ready to graduate. They're all happy and excited, and then we throw this live fire exercise hacking. Um, we call it the the capture the flag, and what we, what we do is there's an incentive. The incentive is an iPad for the group. We we break up each each um, students. We break them up into groups. You know, they choose who they want to be in the group. And then we allow them to attack some lab that a, 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 um, 
the company that we've uh, we work with, they come in and to uh, they set up the lab and they allow these different groups to attack the infrastructures, the servers, the web servers, the, the, the databases. And this is all and, and this is all this is all virtual virtual machines. And so the group that actually wins then gets to go and compete against another organization that has a team of, of uh, pen testers and they do the same thing. And so far since I've been there, the city of refuse students win. <laughs> so it, it, it's a great exercise. Everybody gets involved in it. It's a full day. I mean, e even the students that are on the borderline who are still struggling to, to, to understand this whole concept of cybersecurity, they're involved. It's just a wonderful thing. You should come come back down, Adam, and take a look at it. it it's well. It's let's let's thing. be blunt. This is part of the phenomenal give back that Cyberbit gives to the education industry. They run the si live fire exercise. They structure mm -hmm. it, and they compete. And I, you did better than I did. We won one time. Our students beat one of the big company. I won't embarrass them, but so remember, the team they're competing against is a professional team that has worked together. And still, the students are competitive after nine months with this kind of immersive program. But again, this is. Matt, Daryl, this is 50 hours a week, 55 hours a week for the students. I mean, this is hard. This is a hard, life is hard. Your goal is to make them harder, as they say. But right. you now again, uh, that's why I'm proud to, to, to be on this podcast with my colleagues here from Cyberbit. Um, but this is part of the give back, but it's the ultimate test. And then, but remember, the employers get to watch the students in action. Mm -hmm. And what better interview are you ever going to have? Yeah. Then the employer watching the students in action against your team. Absolutely. And the way Cyberbit runs it, it's a collaborative and it's fun, but it's, you know, one of the last uh, is we have those seven essential life skills. The last one is agency under duress. So when the human feces hits the oscillating fan, can you perform? <laughs> they do. So my, my hat's off to you guys. I was so impressed with what you've done, Daryl and Matt. There's another question. Carol? Yeah. Uh, are you working with industry vendors like EDR, MDR? SIM, identity access management, etc. Are you working with any industry vendors uh, to offer insights on the tools, kind of get them acquainted with the tools? Want to take that one, Matt? Um, I'm not. I'm not aware that we're currently working directly with any industry vendors. Although, um, although uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, for a job fair that we had yesterday, there was a representative here from Palo Alto. So, mm, so like I said. It. Yeah, um, I think that's that's an area that we would like to grow, um, but but currently we don't we don't really work directly with any uh, of the cybersecurity vendors that that I'm aware yeah. of. One of the and things I again this, uh, I can add in, on, from the cyberbit perspective, one of the things that we do to help educators in that sense is you know rather when you with from rather than you guys having to go to the to each vendor. And generating the relationship where, when we provide the cyber range for universities, it basically includes all these licenses in the platform. So students would mm -hmm. use Splunk, Palo, um, F5, and various other tools that are basically part of a larger cyber range. So that's a way to basically get a bulk of industry tools into a an exercising scenario or learning context. Uh, without actually having to go to each vendor to do the licensing or to uh, uh, or, or, or to build a specific program with each one, you have them all together basically in a cybersecurity context. So that's one thing you could do. Okay. Yeah, the platform was so important. We didn't have to go out and build all these relationships to keep it simple. We had a platform, the Cyberbit platform, it has a lot of commercial tools in it. And even if it's not the exact commercial tool, if some of the students were preparing for interviews, we could say, hey, get in the range, do some of these exercises with a like kind of commercial technology and the employer mm -hmm. could tell, oh, but you know, if you've been using this firewall, then you're going to know how to do this one. Mm -hmm. And that helped the students a lot to get into, Sharon asked a, a really interesting question earlier about the careers that they get into. That's what helped them have a breadth of careers that they get into as opposed to the classic SOC analyst. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. if there's last words of wisdom you want to share with the audience, but I want to value everybody's time and thank you both so much, not just thank for you. being on the podcast, but what you're doing for the students for the next generation in an inner city with the arguably one of the most difficult contexts in America is truly humbling. Thank you so, thank you. so much. Well, thank you.
Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Thanks you for allowing yeah. me to come in and talk about the program. Thank you very much. I'll give some um, practical uh, suggestions in just a minute, but uh, I see there's a request for contact information. So I know, Shahal, that you're already going to type that in. So it sounds like if some of the folks who want to contact you directly to get some insights and tips from your uh, successful program. Again, if there's any other question, we've got another minute or so. Uh, or you can raise your hand and go live if you like. We've got just a couple more minutes. But in the meanwhile, if not, I'll thank uh, you, Matt, Daryl, Adam, of course, the audience for spending this hour with us. We really appreciate it. Um, as I've mentioned, you will be able to find uh, the podcast Cyber Sensei on Spotify, on Apple and Google Podcasts. Just search for Cyber Sensei. Uh, and on the Cyberbit YouTube channel, if you want to watch our, our pretty faces on video, you can do that uh, over there. You won't have that on, on Spotify yet. Uh, and you can follow Cyberbit on LinkedIn to get uh, updates on the future podcast and other education topics. We will um, circulate uh, an email, a thank you email to all of you with the recording, or you can just go right to the to the podcast platforms and grab it over there. It will take us a couple of days to edit it and publish it and um, can guarantee that you will all get it. Again, I want to thank uh, everyone on this uh, podcast. It was a very packed hour. We've got a lot of questions, which means that it, you guys really did a great job. And I personally uh, learned a lot. And it sounds like some folks want to contact you after this session. So really appreciate it. It was really educating. And thank you so much. Thank you.